Next is spurling sign. What is spurling sign? So in a lumbar disc prolapse, we are doing straight leg raising test and femoral nerve stretch test to diagnose uh, uh, um, sciatica or the radicular pain. Same, same, same way in cervical radiculopathy, we are doing spurling test. What is spurling test? So here, whenever the patient is, you are suspecting a cervical radiculopathy, make the patient to sit down, extend the neck, and rotate the neck to the same side, okay? Extension of the neck and rotation to the same side. When you do that, the patient will have increase in the intensity of the pain. Why it is happening? So, when you extend the neck and rotate to the same side, the cervical foramen, the size of the cervical foramen comes down. The nerve gets pinched, okay? Therefore, the pain increases. Normal, in a normal patient, the foramen is normal, this maneuver will not cause any pain. Whenever there is a disc prolapse or there is a disc osteophyte complex, when you do this maneuver, it will be further, the foramen will be further narrowing of the foramen will take place and there will be increase in pain. This is called as purling stress. Very, very important test. You should elicit this. Second, second maneuver, axial cervical compression test. Just to make the patient sit, stand behind the patient, put your both the hands over the neck, just give a gentle axle. Don't push it. Don't do it very roughly. Gentle axle compression. What happens? Whenever you do an axle compression, the foramen size shrinks. Okay? Then the, 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 the intensity of the radical pain increases. Again, it is like a uh, nerve tension sign. So these two are the nerve tension signs. Spurling sign, wherein you do extension, rotation of the neck. Second is axle compression. Where you live, where you compress the head, which will increase the pain. These two are the nerve root tension signs. Second, nerve root uh, tension releasing signs. First is cervical distraction test, just opposite of the axial compression test. Cervical, just hold the chin and the occiput of the patient. Try to lift it. Don't lift it. Just give an upward thrust. What happens? The foramen will open up. The pain will reduce. Okay. This is the basis of giving cervical traction in cervical radiculopathy. I don't, I don't use, the, I don't prefer cervical traction, but this is the mechanism with which it works. Okay, one thing. Second, shoulder abduction sign. I was saying this is called as, this is called as Davidson sign. So whenever the patient abducts the arm and keeps the hand over the neck, what happens? The nerve root tension relieve. Okay, so whenever they are hanging the arms down, the stretch over the brachial plexus or the nerve root increases. Whenever they are abducting, the stretch over the nerve roots or the brachial plexus decreases, thereby decreasing the pain. This is called as Davidson sign. Simple. So you have to remember two signs for nerve root, increase the nerve root tension, spurling sign, axial compression. Two signs for relieving the nerve root compression, axial distraction and shoulder abduction sign, which is called as Davidson sign. Okay. Peculiar arrangement in cervical spinous, we have got seven cervical vertebra and eight cervical cervical roots. So when you see here, so C1 nerve root arises above C1 pedicle. C2 nerve root arises above C2 pedicle. C3 above C3 pedicle. C7 above C7 pedicle. And below C7, we have C8 nerve root. Okay, you should remember that. Only then you can diagnose where is the disc prolapse and which root is involved. So here in lumbar spine, see for example, there are two kinds of disc prolapses. There is paracentral disc prolapse or there is a far lateral disc prolapse. For example, if there is a L4, L5 disc prolapse, if it is a paracentral disc prolapse, it will compress the L5 root. If there is a far lateral disc prolapse, it will compress the L4 root. Okay. Paracentral, far lateral, two different roots are affected. It is because this the, the roots travel down and exits. But in cervical spine, it is not so. It is just uh, horizontally, it exits the thought and travels. There is no traveling down and exiting. It just exits horizontally. So here, either you are having central disc prolapse or a paracentral or a foraminal disc prolapse, the affected node will be the same. 
so if it is a c6 c7 uh, if it is a c6 c7 nerve root if it is a c6 c7 disc prolapse c7 nerve root will be involved if it is a c7 t1 uh, disc prolapse c8 nerve root will be involved okay so the arrangement of the nerve root is different in cervical spine compared to the lumbar spine so whenever there is a nerve root is where disc, disc, disc is prolapsed the root above the number above will be involved c6 c7 c7 is involved c5 c6 c6 is involved you should remember this now going on to the uh, each nerve roots so here in c4 c5 disc prolapse c5 nerve root will be involved so what is the motor power motor uh, test for c5 nerve root one is shoulder abduction which is by deltoid muscle and elbow flexion which is by biceps so these two uh, this thing we should examine so elbow flexion is both by both c5 and c6 and predominantly by c5 nerve root one thing second sensory sensory is as i said earlier it's along the anterolateral aspect of the shoulder region third reflex reflex is by biceps reflex so motor is shoulder abduction elbow flexion sensation is along the anterolateral aspect of the shoulder reflex is biceps second whenever there is c5 c6 disc prolapse c6 nerve root is involved what is the motor for uh, c6 uh, nerve root it's mainly wrist extension wrist extension is the main motor uh, uh, thing we have to check one as i said earlier elbow flexion is also partly supplied by c6 nerve root sensation sensation is along the radial border of the forearm index finger and thumb finger third sense uh, reflex reflex is supinator reflex so uh, to be specific motor for c6 is the wrist extension sensation for c6 along the radial aspect of the forearm thumb and index finger reflex is supinator reflex c7 nerve root c7 nerve root will be involved whenever there is c6 c7 disc prolapse the most common disc prolapse in cervical spine is c6 c7 disc prolapse the motor is triceps elbow extension okay so it's the pro gravity muscle so uh, exam uh, eliciting weakness in triceps is little bit difficult you have to be very specific one second thing is wrist flexion wrist flexion is the second motor muscle group supplied by c7 nerve root we have to examine both sensation is uh, mainly along the middle finger sensation is mainly along the middle finger reflex is triceps reflex so motor is triceps and the wrist flexion sensation along the middle finger reflex is triceps reflex c7 whenever there is c7 t1 disc prolapse c8 nerve root is involved which is very very rare but usually whenever there is a c8 radiculopathy we, we might confuse it with ulnar neuropathy because the pain will be along the ulnar nerve uh, dermatome so the pain or the sensory disturbance will be along the ulnar aspect of the forearm and the hand okay involving the ring finger and the little finger one thing second the motor power is uh, abduction and adduction of the fingers abduction and adduction of the fingers and finger flexors these things we should we should test reflexes there is no reflex for c8 radiculopathy uh, c7 t1 disc prolapse is very rare if it occurs it involves c8 nerve root we have to differentiate c8 nerve root radiculopathy from ulnar neuropathy okay few more things is so we are seeing the motor power sensory all these are from the c5 nerve root only so very rarely there can be c3 nerve root involvement or c4 radiculopathy can also occur upper cervical radiculopathy so in these conditions upper cervical radiculopathy there won't be any radiating pain along the upper limb but patient will have occipital pain shoulder pain and scapular pain even in these conditions patient will have sperling sign and davidson sign will be positive so the patient is having very severe pain mainly axial pain leading to the scapular region for examining the patient 
if the patient is having positive spiraling sign and Davidson sign, those are the nerve root tension signs. You should suspect high cervical nerve roots, nerve root radicopathy. Okay. Second, so when you are examining this patient, you are suspecting some C7 nerve root involvement, and there is an exaggeration. Usually, what happens in radiculopathy, the reflex will be absent. If the reflex is exaggerated in the presence of radicular symptoms, you should think about myelopathy. So what is that? Usually the there is if you get an older examiner, they will exam, they will ask the question. So what is the difference between radiculopathy and radiculopathy and myelopathy? So in radiculopathy, the, the nerve root is uh, compressed and the pain radiates along that radical or the nerve root. That is called as radiculopathy. We can have cervical radiculopathy, thoracic radiculopathy, or sub radiculopathy. What is myelopathy? Myelopathy, there is a compression of the cord, okay, cervical or thoracic cord, leading to myelopathic symptoms or UAM symptoms below the level of the compression. That is called as myelopathy. So, whenever there is an exaggerated determinant reflexes on your examination or if there is a plantar extensor, is there, always think about myelopathy and you should examine the patient thoroughly. So you have seen a patient presenting with a neck pain, with a radicular pain. So you are examining. So you have come to a conclusion the patient is having some C6 or C7 radiculopathy. What will you do next? Okay. The first basic line of investigation is X-ray. Okay. So what do you see in the X-ray? So you see here, this is the normal X-ray. So here we should, we, should, we should see three or four things. First is the alignment of the X-ray. So, what is the alignment of the cervical spine? You can see here. So, normally cervical spine is lordotic. Whether the lordose of the cervical spine is maintained or not. First thing you have to see. Second thing. So, you are seeing the cervical disc spaces. Whether the cervical disc spaces are maintained or not. Okay. The third thing. Whether there is any osteophytes in the anterior. Usually, there can be posterior osteophytes on the one which just that covers the nerve root. But usually it will be it is difficult to see the posterior osteophyte in the x-ray. Whenever there is an anterior osteophyte, you should think that there is a possibility of posterior osteophyte in that case. So here for example, here you see the patient. So here the lordosis is not maintained. Okay. So you can see here. So almost it's a straight spine or there is a 